Um, thank you for the inspiring presentation. Now we are going to the section one. So today we have a total of four sections, and it will end by a cross talk. For the first section, where are women's voices in textile and technology? So we have speakers, Ms. Janice Jeffrey, Mr. Edwin Kay, and moderator, Ms. Ingrid Chu. So Janice uh, was trained as a painter early in her studies. She's an artist, writer, curator, and a professor of visual arts at Goldsmith University of London. Janice was one of the first founding uh, editor of Textile, the Journal of Clothes and Culture, and co-editor of First Handbook of Textile Culture. Adwin as CEO of Hong Kong Research Institute of Textiles and Apparel. She's also part of the faculty at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and the Hong Kong UST, where he teaches supply chain operation. Prior to that, Adwin managed a consulting group and did work for nonprofit organization and charities. Ingrid is a curator and writer based in Hong Kong with experience at leading museums and nonprofit organizations such as um, Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, a creative time in New York. Her reviews, interviews, and articles have been featured in international contemporary art and cultural, uh, culture publication, and she is currently co-curating the editorial, uh, a program of the Taipei Biennial 2016. So may I now have the two speakers and moderator on the stage, please. Short. <laughs> so uh, in each of the sections, uh, each speaker will give 20 minutes of presentation, and then it will be uh, ended by 20 minutes uh, moderated discussion section. Thank you very much, and good morning. Uh, again, thank you to the Mill team for the invitation and the hospitality, and to uh, the conversations. Um, I've, uh, being something of an academic, I've kind of literally taken why, uh, uh, where are, I was going to say why not, uh, women's voices in textiles and technology. Um, <clears throat> I also want to start with Greek mythology, why not? It's the cradle of European civilization. I am a European, and oh, we have a very interesting project in Cyprus, actually, in uh, October of this year, which is called Weaving Across Europe, which is, of course, trying to maintain the principles of European uh, discourse and collaboration. Um, some of the material is research in progress and therefore um, not yet published, and we have to respect some of the PhD students uh, working on the projects. So I might whiz over quickly the technical bits as they have to um, publish in IEEE and we don't want to prevent their future careers. Um, I've already taken 41 seconds. Okay. Now, uh, we've got a, a couple of slides to start with and me talking, um, and then more slides as we kind of go through and less talking. Um, if I can ask you to just think about two things, really, that I want to emphasize. One is there have always been women voices. They just have been rather hidden. Uh, and the secondly, the relationship of the practices of textile has been emphasized through this idea of nimble fingers and particularly early marketing strategies in the 1960s, emphasized particularly this notion of the Asian, inverted commas, girl, always young girl, under 14, who was particularly nimble. And the same lines of marketing and thinking have been introduced in areas of computer programming. And having worked in both uh, visual arts and computing, I can testify to the synergies of this idea of nimble fingers. So there's just two things to think about. But I'm going to start with Greek mythology, too, in honor of uh, Mitsuko's idea of the thread. And many of you will remember that in Homer's uh, Odyssey, Penelope wove for three years a shroud 
the father of her husband who was always traveling, Odysseus. And she would try and unweave at night to dissuade her suitors from entering into her chamber to try and marry her because it was thought Odysseus would die. Now, the point about the Penelope mythology is that she's not a helpless female character or a renowned weaver, but she's actually a very earnest, strong-minded of that time, of that generation, um, who acts with cleverness and ingenuity. And certainly, if we then think about her as someone who blended fabric and words to forestall Odysseus's dissolution, she used her guiding thread of thinking to weave the structure of her scheme. And as many commentators have noted, have expressed weaving wiles or to weave a crafty scheme. So think of that as a, a verb, to be crafty, to be cunning, to have guile. And is frequently used by Homer, for example, to denote reasoning or devising a plan. So there's a kind of intelligence and thought, a way of knowing, that also implies a very coherent body of mental attitudes, intellectual behavior, which combine flair, wisdom, subtlety of mind, deception, et cetera, et cetera. Now, textiles power. I, I'm showing this particular painting. Why not? Here we have the spider's web, and that's a very obvious connection to contemporary thoughts on technology. So textiles power to communicate beyond text is immortalized in the story of Arachne, a skilled young weaver who challenges Athena, the goddess, to a weaving contest. And although during that contest it becomes very clear that Arachne can weave as quickly and as ably as the goddess, and her finished piece is as flawless as her own, the goddess, Athena, is challenges, is, turns Arachne into a spider, a spider's web. Now the question there is, was it simply that Arachne's skill enraged Athena, or the story's detail suggests that the symbolic content of Arachne's ornamentation threatened, in other words, ornamentation, mess, going off script, going out of order, being crafty, threatened Athena more than the so-called craftsmanship. Athena embroidered the council of gods properly and orderly scenes that reinforced her position as patron goddess of Athens. But Arachne is important to us today because she's one of the first heroines of networking and weaving, who is not a god or a king. And in fact, Obviv praises her for her worldly skill. Today, there's a fascination for her spider's webs, her spirited running around, running amok, with willful abandon, disrupting the forces of logic and law. As much as for the World Wide Web, its spatial capacities, for moving across the borders of all kinds of restrictions of so-called proper behavior. Now, we can argue, I think, that most of the network myths, and particularly in the Old Testament, show a highly refined sense of different topologies of webs and nets. Already in the ancient Orient, there's no such thing as one net or one network, but a multitude of interconnected textile objects. And I think making a very imaginative leap across decades, from Arachne, we can make this link to textiles as a metaphor for society and politics in contemporary times, following an entwined network of threads through history. And paradoxically, we can also think of textiles as the foundation of industrialization, British colonial destruction of local industries, and world trade but they also have the ability to weave together or tear apart. Hence the project in Cyprus, weaving across Europe. Now, gender is, for example, not an issue for Karl Marx. Go to Das Kapital. He has a very interesting narrative about a coat and how it's made. But for gendered agency, we have to turn to Gorati Spivak's 1988 essay, Candace Bolton Speak. And the question here she poses is how colonial records rarely tell us about what women said, but rather emphasize how women spoke. And this example, or this question, can apply to women who are sweatshop workers in the East, London's East End, where I came from, 
or the peace workers in the export-based garment industry in Bangladesh, with whom they seem to be in competition. And that's a long, complicated story of colonial uh, enterprise. Right. So I'm now losing my place, so excuse me for shuffling my papers. Very good. So, in giving voice to Ariadne's thread, Ariadne's thread, as cited in Misiko's introduction to textile, we can then make a conceptual move to Sadie Plant's 1997 book, Zero and Ones. It explores the text of the textile in another register, digital women and the new techno-culture, as she called it then, which is also in turn about weaving. As Plant has written in her earlier 1995 essay, Future Looms, Women, Weaving and Cybernetics, the jacquard system of punch card programs brought the information age to the beginning of the 19th century. The automated loom was the first to store its own information, functioning with its own software, an early migration of control from weaver to machinery, and that's an important point. So whatever we think of as the true or complex relation between loom and computer, Sadie Plant makes a point that is always worth considering, that control has migrated from weaver to machine. So the whole history of loom technology is a history of the migration of binary control from weaver to machine, from the work of women in many societies whose real but often invisible labor were a necessity to industrialization, mass production, and advanced technological processes of the 20th century. Throughout this history, to control a weave meant to decide whether a warp thread was to be picked up or not. To control the process was to shift a major economic field or to reiterate Spivak's point, which I referenced earlier, quote, the female ground layer that holds up contemporary global capital. And it's certainly been left to artists writers, cultural theorists, post-colonial writers, oral historians and curators to unpack these texts, these textiles and technology, then operating concurrently is that of women's role in art and technology, which has still recently been a rather relatively, comparatively hidden history. Now, many women artists have highlighted the gendered politics of computer culture in the 20th century. There's a 2001 book called Feminism in the 20th Century Science, Technology and Medicine, which examines this history as being rooted in the military and in engineering. And there's one particular paper from 1998 by Joan Thurnbrod, Gender Issues in the Electronic Arts Inform the Creation of New Modes of Computing, in which she describes this culture as being encoded and compounded by the syntax, command, and control structures that reflect computing operating systems and their associated history with business and military applications, suggesting how this context has made many female artists working with computers at that time feeling very alienated. And here's a quote. Computing is one of these social constructs that have been formulated within the socio-political milieu. Perhaps it's surprising then that the early years of electronic computing saw the role of programming remarkably receptive to female labor and not as stratified along gender lines as other technical professions. This unexpected issue or state of affairs can be illustrated by the Computer Girls, an article in Cosmopolitan magazine from April 1978, which featured female uh, or asked the general fashionable female readership, this is 1976, remember, so cosmetology was thought of as fashionable, to consider careers in programming, describing the field as offering promising opportunities for women. And in fact, quoting a very distinguished computer scientist, Dr. Grace Hopper, who said that programming was, quote, just like planning a dinner. You have to plan ahead and schedule everything so that when it's ready, you need it. Programming requires patience and the ability to handle detail. Women, she said, are naturals at computer programming. Now, this does go back to another essay in 1984, sorry, later, but it's connected, which made the comment, Diane Nielsen, that in Asia, 
women have nimble fingers and dexterity, those kinds of skills which made them natural for textile work at home and in industry. So in that sense, computer programming and textile work are linked. Now the decades following the 1960s saw the programming profession become increasingly masculinized. Professional associations, educational requirements, advertising campaigns that were very targeted at men. So I emphasize this point that just as the whole history of loom technology is a history of the migration of binary control for, from weavers, mostly women, to machines, mostly men, the turn to programming became an increasingly masculinized profession, served to reinforce contemporary gender preconceptions and stereotypes. And so this assertion, going back to Thurnbrod's essay, perhaps supports the view that Western technology itself embodies patriarchal values. However, and in Women, Technology and Art, which is also published by MIT Press, actually have used emerging cultural analysis of technology as a framework to examine the relationship between gender and technology. And what a surprise. These cultural products or processes are examined to suggest that gender and technological meanings are not fixed or given, but they are made. Now, tellingly, a number of contemporary art and design networks have established, been established to address the imbalance of women artists working in arts and technology. Um, we ran a Thursday club for many years at Goldsmiths. These are just examples of the posters that we devised for some of those debates. And also bringing into history, there's the geographies of craft, and also with Lillian Lynn, who was one of the first artists to show in the Venice Biennale in 1980 with her technological moving sculptural Amazon women, in fact. And this, which is not imperial, but it's Queen Mary, University of London. And this is the G-Hack, the Girl Hack Club. Surprisingly, at Queen Mary, on this program, no women uh, tutors, and yet majority of women students. So they had to self-organize, create a network to generate those kinds of issues that they wanted raised. And this is a recent exhibition at Waterman's Art Center Technology is not neutral, and it targets the frequent underrepresentation of the achievements of women in the field of digital art. It showcases the contribution of female artists in shaping what digital art technology and collaboration is today. And the curatorial concept, for example, focuses on a diversity of approaches and methodologies, including the sequencing of bacteria. This is the exhibition. In fact, the conference is today. And this is Anna's sequence dress, which indeed is a sequencing of bacteria as it grows and changes. Robotic performance, data as an artistic medium, biologically inspired simulation, site-specific online transmission, digital print, kinetic art, telepresence, social media, activisms, drone choreography, brainwave art, and hacking realities. So a whole kind of compositive, diverse range of practices. And in the last five minutes, I'm just going to, oh, this is something uh, which was referenced as founding the first journal of cloth and culture. And our first um, special issue in 2004-05 was a collaboration between me and the head of computing at Goldsmiths, uh, Robert Zimmer. So that's the first really peer-reviewed academic journal from the area of textile practices, cloth and culture, looking at how these collaborations could be engendered. This last part really features myself and my collaborator of over 20 years, Barbara Lane, Concordia University in Montreal, Montreal in uh, Canada. And this is the voices across the Atlantic. And this just indicates the body of work, perhaps, where we started to think about how interdisciplinary collaboration, our voices, has been so core to many of women's research work. So we've worked with various teams of postgraduate students since 19, 2002, and this is the first joint publication, Hacking the Museum. This is probably what we're best known for, wearable absence. 
which you're not going to be able to see very clearly, but perhaps when the publication comes out, and a whole range of uh, supporters, investors, and research councils. That's the only way we can develop research. And here, which is a very short video to introduce it. This is early days, really. So we're looking at the textiles of the um, next part of the 21st century as we go deeper into the 21st century. So looking at textiles in combination with sound and with media, that's really what I've concentrated on. This particular work that you see behind me is by um, Barbara Lane and Janice Jeffries. It's called Wearable Absence, and it's looking at um, wearable electronics, wearable technology. With this, with this particular um, jacket, both for female and for male, we're looking at a, an individual's personal data being downloaded um, from a database that is then made visible in the jacket. Um, there's other work that's... Okay, and that's a quick um, introduction. And just to finish, really, on the enchantment of cloth, which, like wearable absence, is funded by the Social Sciences Research Council of Canada, which has a section called Research Creation. And it examines how the social implications and privilege of wearing precious metals in the past have been used, experienced, and sometimes worn. And so we visited, in London, the British Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Museum of Toronto in textiles. And our question is, how can these wearable technologies both indicate status while facilitating social connections in real time? How can, in fact, couching techniques... Oh, but this is in the museum in Canada with our research assistants, uh, Roxanne Saunacy, who's president of the Sextile Society in America, with Helen Wolfe from the British Museum. And the point really is to show the drawings and the relationships of conductive thread, which are couched on an industrial machine, and the antennae, which is the electronic communication in cloth. Uh, couching techniques, many of you will know. I have to say this is from the Silk Museum. This is a very bad image, but it's very interesting that they had an example of the early methodologies of couching. And this is the laying machine. It can lay a 1,000 threads a minute. I think you get the picture. There's the slow, the couching, the silver. We're using conductive threads, fast, efficient, but there's a lot of technical processing between. So how can these couching uh, methods with that laying machine now from historical textile research be transformed into a conductive circuitry appropriate for the collective communications potentially possible of the 21st century? It, this is a Branco belt from uh, Constantinople from the British Museum, 15th century, uh, now known as Istanbul. Um, and various rendering processes, drawings, uh, Tashin trying to work out the maximum uh, thinness. That's a perversity, I know. So it doesn't affect when we put on the antennae, the uh, electric currents into the skin. Oops, this is the team. Uh, Chashin from Pakistan, Sarah from Iran, Hassan from Iran, and Sarah from Canada. So we have to rely, and we work together collaboratively across the Atlantic and in space to, um, to make these devices. And this is the conclusion. This is, I have the sample with me, actually. And the antennae becomes in the eye, it's on the dress, there's a team, and once you set it up, you have that communication of a historic item uh, between those up to four at the moment we've got with the device. Hence my interest in rank badges and how the rank can be inverted through popular culture mechanisms to indicate different kinds of status. Okay, I'm one and a half minutes over. So making in the physical world implies unmaking, remaking, making new connections across people and place the physical and the virtual, through manipulation of textile materials, processes, methods, histories, technologies. New knowledges are produced, particularly by women, whose voices are excavated across time and space, myths and stories, histories and oral testimonies. So one can argue, or one can make an argument, that runs along these lines. 
that the resurgence in textiles is simultaneous with the global growth in electronic communications. And while this conjunction with physical artifacts and practices in the age of electronic computing may appear to be somewhat paradoxical, technology has indeed provided a different kind of network of social relations and distributions, particularly for women who transfer their skills from the physical to the program. And as such, textiles, as one of the oldest, is also one of the newest technologies around. And it takes us through its own web, a journey back to the future, and Akriana's web continues. Thank you. Not too bad, two and a half minutes. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm really humbled to be here. Um, I, I, as, as part of the, the research center, I, I, I do my fair share of presentations, and usually it's on boring scientific um, stuff that I have a lot of control over. And, and to be asked to talk about something like this uh, for me um, is, is challenging. This is one of the few times that I've actually lost sleep over thinking about what am I going to talk about that makes sense. Um, so a couple of things. This is a, um, a presentation based on really my recent research into, into the topic. Two, um, there are so many international experts here today, I'm, I'm going to confine my, my, uh, my remarks to the local story, the Hong Kong story of, of women and, and textile and, and the development of fashion industry here. And, and then thirdly, this is not a polish. Uh, presentation. This is really uh, is me speaking as honestly uh, as I can about the subject, uh, and 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 I would hope that there is more. Uh, there's a lot of reaction from all of you after the remarks are are, are done, because I would love to learn uh, about more about the subject as well. It's 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 one of the things I love about Hong Kong is how small it is, and how sometimes wonderfully fate can play with you when you're in a small city. So, so this morning at 8.30, my wife and I were at the Sports Institute, uh, where, where the research center, we, we work with a couple of um, Olympic teams, Hong Kong Olympic teams, to equip them for, uh, for, for the Olympics. So we just finished the Rio projects, and we, we, have, we just kicked off the, um, uh, the, Japan, the 2020 Japan projects. And so there we are, uh, walking around with, with uh, the, the rowing team this morning. Um, and there's 20 and 30, uh, these really, in good shape, young athletic women who walk around with this great degree of confidence because they can slug me and, and you know they can beat me in, in arm wrestling and everything, um, and and who who carry themselves with such confidence because they're in peak physical shape. Uh, I go from there to here, and tonight I'm flying to to India where one of my projects is. I'm working with an NGO, which I'll I'll show you some pictures of uh, that. Um, rescue girls from human traffickers and then employ them in, in a, and teach them skills in sewing so they can be employed in, in, in factories. And, and that's the, that's the, the weave of, of, of my day and it only ha can happen in, in, in a place like Hong Kong when all these things can happen simultaneously. Women, industry, fashion are all part of the, the Hong Kong story. I look out in the audience and there's too many people with black hair to understand this or remember this, but this was a, there was a time uh, when, when, when we think about fashion today, it's clean, it's, it's fancy, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's sophisticated. But really for Hong Kong, uh, for many years, we were on the back end of this, right? The, the, the whole development of Hong Kong is around the, the, the fashion business uh, and, and, and that as an opportunity for people who came from an agrarian uh, culture, very poor and very desperate, descending en masse into this very crowded city and figuring out, now what am I going to do? All of my skills and all of my history is, is tied to the earth, and this obviously is a place in which that's not going to, to happen. So, so all that development in the 50s and the 60s uh, in which people lived um, um, re really poorly and in a tough situation, trying to figure out what's next. 
And, and along that way, as, as we figure out how to, to uh, live with each other in, in society and in community, we figured out maybe one of the things we can do is move on to, to do something which is technology driven, which is the high tech industry of that, of that period. And, and that is to begin to start in this, this making of stuff. And what can Hong Kong make uh, because there's so much uh, labor uh, available? Why don't we start making textiles? Because there's this demand, uh, this, this fundamental demand that we are clothed and, 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 and we are sheltered. And so the, the humble beginnings of, of, of Hong Kong, where there are these workshops in the 50s and 60s and the 70s, in which, uh, and, and then more technology is, is introduced, uh, in which we started making things for the bottom end of, 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 of the textile and apparel industry, um, pajamas and, and, and children's clothing and things like that. And we got better and better at it. Uh, and, and that provided the, the employment opportunities for all these, for all these women who came uh, as part of the, this whole wave of, of refugees to, to be gainfully employed and to do something uh, 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 productive that, that, that makes money for them. And this was a, this was a, a, a more basic society. I, 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 I wish I had more roots in this. My, my father and my mother came to Hong Kong as, as refugees. They were they were very, they from a wealthy, privileged family in Shanghai, and all of a sudden they have to start over again. My, my dad became one of these industrialists. Um, and, and for me, growing up, that just seemed like that's, that's normal. So these types of uh, uh, um, environments and talking about industry is, is normal. Um, and, and I wish my friend Pak Nin Ng is, is in the audience, uh, because there's a picture of his father here. You know, uh, the, the Central Text House, which is down the, the road from, uh, from Mill 6. Uh, I, I saw the old building uh, yesterday. And here's this group of confident industrialists, right? Uh, obviously, none of these guys have ever worked as, as, as blue collars, but they are the, 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 the brains and the finance behind the Hong Kong story. And, and, and they are the people who, uh, who, who created this whole industry. Behind them uh, uh, is this wealth that they created, right? You know, they, they, they employed all these uh, thousands and thousands of women, but in the process created this, this order and, and created this wealth for Hong Kong. And so Hong Kong got better, right? The, the, the wooden shacks are replaced by public housing. Uh, it, it, it became more and more of a modern city as a result of that. And, and even the, the, um, the industry in Hong Kong began to move upstream from, from uh, uh, it's created more sophisticated and more uh, more value from from textile mills to to uh, apparel factories uh, to to sewing plants, um, in which a lot of people were able to to uh, to use and learn their skills to make a um, a living. The the movie the the idealized movie that we saw this morning was was that that. Uh, uh, life uh, in these factories. Not as cheerful and, and as musical as, as the movie would imply, but certainly the alternative, the alternative would, would be a lot harsher. And, and, and for women like this, the alternative at, at this point in time is this madness that is going on right across the border in, in China, in which there, there is this, this collective um, madness, and, and, and this is the era of, of the Great Leap Forward and, and uh, all, all these disastrous experiments that really didn't work. And so Hong Kong is, 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 a, is a beacon of, of shining hope. And, and this industry, <clears throat> tough as it is, created this, um, the, this, this generation of, of, of women who are able to, to make a living and become independent and actually do something quite, quite productive and useful. And Hong Kong became more and more glamorous, right? So, so there is, this is the 60s. Um, uh, we, we became more, uh, more considerate of, our, of, the, of the quality of life that, that, uh, that we take for granted now. The arts came in um, uh, and, and became more prominent. Uh, we became more colorful. Uh, and we became more prosperous. We, we had bigger families. Uh, we, we have intergenerational uh, gatherings. Um, uh, so so it, was, it, was a, it was a rapid ascent uh, for, for us. Um, and the factories, what happened to them? Well, they, they became better, and they became more modernized, and they became larger. 
And then they disappeared. Right? They became offices. And then they became these clean places where, where we work, but you don't work with your hands. Uh, you, 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 we, are, we now want you to engage uh, the brain a lot more. So where do we go from here? Um, what is going to happen to, to us and, and to all the women that, that, that came, came through this experience? I want to talk a little bit about the, 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 uh, uh, some of, some of the, the stories that I've heard uh, as, re as, as part of this research for this, for this project. Um, so, so first of all, our story uh, is being repeated somewhere else. Uh, Leslie Chang wrote this, this great book about factory girls, uh, about the, the Dongguan experience, mostly in, in the last 10, 15 years, because even that is moving on right now. So, so this, this whole, uh, uh, the, the, what we went through uh, 50 years ago is being repeated in another language in another place. But then there are also these heroic stories that I, that, 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 that I see every now and then. This is a series of photos that somebody took of this young girl who is working in a brick factory in China. Um, and, and, and what I love about this series of photos is that I, I, I look at this girl and I look at the determination uh, on her face. Right? You, you, you look at somebody like this and, and, and the, the optimism and, and, and the, uh, the youthfulness of, of this girl. You know she's going to make it. You know somehow she's going to make it uh, because she's going to uh, kick some butt and she's going to overcome all these barriers. Um, and I'm really hopeful when I, when I see faces like this, the, the face of determination. Um, uh, that's the type of grit. That, those are the types of personalities uh, that, that make this place possible. So, so this story, this experience is being repeated uh, somewhere else uh, right now. Um, this is my office cleaner, Zheng Jie. I had a series of conversations with her for the last couple of weeks as I was trying to, desperately trying to figure out what can qualify me to talk uh, uh, this morning. For 30 years, Zheng Jie worked as a linker in a, in a, in a sweater factory in Hong Kong. Uh, started in the 70s as a teenager, raised a family, and made a very uh, good living. Those of you who know anything about sweater making, linking is when you, when you attach the sleeve to the body, if you will. It's when you, 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 uh, you put two panels of knitted fabric together. It's the most skillful part of, of the work because it is, uh, so far, nobody has figured out a way to automate it. Um, so you do it by eye, and you do it by, by hand. Uh, and, and it is still today the slowest part of, of a sweater manufacturing, or knitwear manufacturing. Zhang Jie got so good in which she can do it by feel. And, and today, if you go in a sweater factory and look at the, the really good linkers, they don't even look at this stuff. They, they have this sensation, they've developed these sensitive fingers in which they can figure out where each loop needs to be, and she does this. And, and this um, allowed her to, to, uh, to raise a family and, and for her to have uh, uh, her children to have uh, good careers. When all the factories moved away, and because she had a young family, she didn't go up to China with the, with, with the rest of the, uh, the, the linkers. She uh, opted for, for a, a more menial labor. But she, ha she is one of the most cheerful people I know. And she greets me every morning, and we always have some nice conversation about, about uh, what is going on? She also, because she's in all the offices, know exactly what's going on in the, on the, in the university campus. So, she is my, uh, uh, great, you know, data, uh, uh, data collection from her. Um, I think because she is so optimistic, I think because she has that right personality, that it, it doesn't really bother her. That, that here she has, she's a high skilled artisan. She's able to do something that, that I certainly can't do. And yet she's, she's doing this now, this, 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 this manual work. Um, so she's one side of the, of, 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 the, of the Hong Kong story. Here's the other side of, of a Hong Kong story that I found. Uh, so, so, so Zhang Xin is the CEO of Soho China, uh, one of the largest uh, real estate developing companies in, in, in China. Uh, they had the largest real estate IPO in the world. Uh, when they went public. She's the founder and, and CEO. Um, her life story, and there's, if, you, if you go to the Asian Society, coincidentally, if you go to the Asian Society website, 
she did an interview with Adriana Huffington in September about, about where she came from and her experience. Um, she, um, her parents were intellectuals, and so they were sent down to the, um, to the village uh, during the Cultural Revolution. At nine years old, her mother uh, and her were allowed back into Beijing. They were homeless, and they lived in the streets uh, for about two years. When she was 14, they were allowed to leave China, and they immigrated to Hong Kong. From 14 to 19, she sold buttons uh, on, uh, and in factories, in, in, in garment factories. Uh, and they lived in, uh, in very modest conditions. Uh, she got all that to save up enough money to get a ticket to the UK, where she wrangled a full scholarship and um, graduated, worked for Goldman Sachs, uh, then came back and, and did this, this really wonderful success story uh, that, that, that she has enjoyed. A very charming, uh, lovely lady. Look at her hands. They're still the hands of a rough laborer, you know, for, for the multimillionaire uh, that she is. Uh, spend time on, on, on the video when, when you get a chance to do that. So she also uh, got there because of what she did here. Um, I'm going to need to, to, to work with this, uh, this NGO called Nomi uh, and, and that, what they do, and it's, it's started by my friend Diane Mao, uh, and she, she courageously uh, wrangles girls away from, uh, from uh, uh, human traffickers and trains them, and I'm, I'm there to, to figure out how to organize that factory so that, so that she can have meaningful employment for, uh, for, for all these girls. Um, uh, and, and she's recognized for it. She's this young, just gutsy young girl and, and just somebody you, you would like and you enjoy hanging out with. Um, another friend of mine, a, a young lady who went to Wharton and then Harvard and then announced to her parents that instead of going to investment banking, she's going to start a, a not-for-profit social enterprise called Shoke, where she makes uh, luxury uh, products out of yak and she does that, and there's Carol. Uh, she does that, she's, it's a Hong Kong company, but she's, she's mostly in Shanghai. And, and the, the proceeds go to work on, human health, uh, on women health issues on the Tibetan Plateau. And she's created this very clever business model in which she has visibility and access to all these people that she, that she worked with. I thought this was a great story. Again, you, know, you, you, you can't help but be energized and excited when you work and, and hang out with, with people like that. Um, you know, and, and this, this all this story about, about things that they can do together as a result of this business that they built. And then, of course, where we are right now. You know, the, the, this, this whole alternative to, to how we look at wealth and success and what we do with our wealth and success in Hong Kong. I was very excited walking through the, uh, the construction site yesterday uh, of, of, of the Mills Project, and you, you can't help but wish this will work because this is a great alternative to, to being very boring and being very um, painting in the lines with, uh, with what you do with your money and, and, and wealth in Hong Kong. Um, Adriana Huffington and, and, and Zhang Xi in, in that um, discussion at the Asian Society talked about the capacity of women. And these I thought were great, that, that the capacity of women is that you build teams and collaborate together much better than men. Uh, compassionate man management, that, that really it, it is a high touch uh, type of experience as opposed to a very strategic view of the world. There is, and I tested that, emotional intelligence, uh, ability to understand um, what should be done, uh, what, is the, what, what is the right thing to do. And, and judgment about aesthetics, make that, 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 that is, it, and it is something which it is you're either in tune with or not in tune with. Women are much better, uh, 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 are successful because they practice that good judgment versus just plowing through and being a blunt instrument. And, and, and then this capacity for wisdom. I thought wisdom was, was an interesting thing to think about because as I think about the, 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 the women in, in, in industry and technology, what are the... Uh, what are the contributions? And here's the ones that I came up with, and, and, I'll, and I'll end on this, that a lot of what, what women do, or, or the feminine influence in industry, is to, to repair and undo the harm. 
Look, the, the globalization and industrialization certainly was useful and necessary for the era that my parents grew up in. But it had unintended consequences. It's not sustainable. So a lot of effort that you see in the examples I raised are really to, to repair and undo a lot of that harm. Um, to, to, to innovate and, 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 and repurpose or, or, or create new purpose for success, wealth, and, and, and power, to use that as a platform to do something different and to do something new. And, and finally, and maybe more importantly, to, to give us a new frame of reference, a new framework of thinking about technology. You know, why do we do this thing? You know, it, this, it, this, is, this, is, uh, this is stuff that, that, uh, that men don't think about because all we want to do is win. Uh, all we want to do is succeed, but maybe we don't think as much about, about, about being healthy uh, and about being wise. Um, and, 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 so, and, and so perhaps all this is, weaves a new tapestry for us. Perhaps all this is a new, new con continuity for, for, for uh, all that we do. Um, Hong Kong changed very rapidly from, from a group of uh, uh, guys in an agricultural society to an industrial society. And we are in the post-industrial society. We're in, uh, uh, we are in a, f a service industry. Uh, and we are in a, in, in a financial economy. And, and we are now working very hard to transition into, into a knowledge economy. And maybe in all of this, maybe in all of this, uh, the, the feminine voice is to, to, to be the soul uh, and, the, and, the, and the underlying purpose for all these transitions and for all that we do. Thank you. So my name is, um, thank you for both Edwin and Janice for those uh, wonderful presentations. Um, again, my name is Ingrid Chu. And uh, first I want to say congratulations and thank you to Angelica and Maizuki and Yik and her entire team. I think this is a great start to a um, wonderful conference. Um, I think, um, and also by way of introduction, I wanted to say, you know, when you do those introductions of people, you sort of get the standard um, bios. And uh, I can say from my conversations, uh, particularly with Angelica, um, my, I am one of those people who, when first meeting her and hearing about Mill 6, uh, immediately told her that my mother was a seamstress and uh, worked very hard both here and, you know, um, immigrating to Canada. And um, I've thought a lot about that since um, being invited here to talk, because I think to uh, the idea of the personal and the subjective is... Uh, very, very important, and I wanted to sort of bring in um, something slightly personal as a way to sort of ground um, our discussion on this stage. Um, I wanted to start with also a writing in progress for what uh, we've been tasked here to do, and then maybe from there I wanted to um, talk about three um, topics of interest, I think, that have some, um, bear some, um, I guess, relationships to uh, the presentations you've said, um, just made. So this is tentatively titled Hands-On. Uh, technology is often perceived as a projection into the future. But to mistake this as progress in many ways is simply to veil the manner in which fashion or textiles, if you also want to frame it, continue to affect the lives of women in so many ways. Collectivity through um, embroidery, quilting, even the sweatshop, has bearing on how one group bear the brunt of toil for so many others toss, tossing on, tossing off, tossing away, only for the cycle to begin again. And I just wanted to uh, sort of um, really early notes on a discussion because I think we some of the things that Janice and Edwin both talked about, um, I wanted to think through um, these three topics. First was this idea of um, hand to tool. So whether or not, as I, we were speaking of 
from um, embroidery of high fashion houses to the sweatshop, there's this um, relationship, or the women in the sewing machine, a very direct relationship of um, the body to uh, technology in its various forms, from hand stitching to sewing to um, now genetic modification, all these sort of things that we were speaking about. And so in your, your idea of nimble fingers, I think, was a very, very apt. Um, and so I guess I wanted to just get your uh, feedback about that sort of uh, framework or that topic, maybe from your various experiences, I think, Janice, in, the sort of, in some um, academic, but also some direct experience. And I think um, Edwin uh, was also curious, and you spoke a little bit about it, uh, in terms of um, your relationships working directly with these factories and with um, some of these um, people who are trying to maybe activate that in, uh, in new ways. Well, let me start. Uh, um, so, so some of this is, is, is um, let me frame it this way. So some of this could be the, the BMW Tesla story. Uh, so, so Tesla uh, came from nowhere. And, and they made batteries, and they decided to put an engine on it. BMW, a 100-year-old uh, car company, said, wow, if we better get on this bandwagon, otherwise we'll be left behind. So they took an engine and said, let's figure out how to electrify it. Wh who is going to be the, the, the people that make stuff for us in the future? Are they going to be engineers, or are they going to be artists? It's something that I like, be, be, because um, we still, all of us, have on our, uh, our our bodies the 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 most expensive, heaviest, dumb system uh, in the world. Our clothes and our clothes have not changed for the last 10, 20 years, uh, or for a generation. Our phones have, right? Uh, our watches have. Uh, our cars have. So so, wh who's going to make what? I I, I think will be interesting. Uh, so, one thing to think about, and, and, and so that determines how much skill and how much engineering and, and how do we think about those things uh, going forward. Um, is, it, is it an art or is it a science or is it a, a little bit of both uh, would, would, be, would, would be one interesting thing. Um, I would also think about uh, what, what as, as consumers, what, what do we expect of these things that we walk around in, and, and that determines um, uh, uh, how these things are going to be produced in, in the future. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of something that, 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 that I think about uh, a lot. I will be, I will be very brief. Um, the point about such advancement is also about what constitutes something that is local. And what's interesting in various parts of cities that are trying to resist certain kinds of gentrification or the cultural industries, which I've worked in in London, is the amount of what you, we call tacit knowledge, which is also the experience, and you talked about that. Someone who's worked uh, with cloth or material or an object, um, and an engineer is also potentially that in terms of right. you know, taking those kinds of skills and, and working through in very practical ways. But the kind of the small, the minute, the particular, the tacit knowledge is maybe something that says, well, we don't always have to move to one kind of position of authority or power or uh, ownership. It can be just very particular and within rethinking what a community is or the ideas of neighborhood. So I think there are many different networks, that's my point really, or models that emerge. And the return to the idea of the local or the collective or the activist or reskilling in a funny way. Uh, when I say reskilling, it can be both about how you mend a car, because actually at one time if a car broke down, you might be able to mend it, or you would know the sound of the engine, or you would know about the turning of a wood. And all those things that kind of are being rethought are about trying to control perhaps one's own labor and skill but with a different kind of economic relation. So I think that's the point. I'm going to switch my points because that brings up um, another, I didn't really have questions, but more sort of topics that we can explore. And um, the other thing, uh, another topic I wanted to 
think through, and I was reminded through some of Edwin's um, images, uh, ranging from the um, what I call the sort of gaggle of fashion models to the uh, sweatshops to um, just the even the film that we saw. I was thinking a lot about the idea of um, groups. Um, we'll call it collectivity. We'll call it groups. We'll call it yeah, um, what you will. But it seemed to me, in, in sort of thinking through some of these um, ideas today, um, that there's a lot of um, different kinds of relationships. So we, I was thinking a lot about, you know, in high fashion, the you know women who work in um, to embroider these very, very beautiful um, items that you see in haute couture, um, but down to the sweatshop, which is also a lot of women in um, a big space, sometimes hidden, sometimes um, completely invisible, um, and then. But then also right down to um, fashion shows and things like that. If you think of the back room, you know where everyone's getting ready, and you all of that is obviously being constantly revealed now. Um, um, in part because of technology, we, I feel I always say that we've we're seeing the frame has widened, where you see you know not just the perfect image, but the fashion shoot and behind the scenes, and then the photographers being interviewed, and like you sort of. A lot of more things are being revealed. Um, and so as a result, you see really the great amount of people who are involved in you know, what used to be a final image, a final product, a final item of clothing. You know? so, but at the heart of so much of this are usually a room full of women in some capacity. So in sort of, again... Um, Curious about how you know your own uh, work in uh, touches upon that, or if that's something that you've uh, thought a little bit about, especially yeah. in Hong Kong. Your experience, yeah, in Hong Kong. yeah, yeah. So, 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 first thought is is that our notion of country of origin is 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 um, outdated. We we we, we just the, because it says something on a on a made in label. Um, doesn't really mean that's where it was created, that's where the value is created, and nor necessarily does it mean that those people in that, uh, in that place earned a lot of money as a result of, of, of making that thing in, in, in the first place. So, so where is the value created and, 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 and who is doing what is, is something that is, is quite interesting for us to really explore a little bit more and perhaps understand a little bit more. The average uh, women's pump, uh, the, the, the simplest of shoes, uh, at, at least when I was in the footwear business uh, uh, a decade ago, uh, gets passed through about 125 hands uh, for it to be finished, for it to be assembled. Uh, now, that's, that's teamwork for you, right? Because if one of them, one of them screw up, that, that's uh, the 124 people uh, uh, made a useless product. Um, and, and, but in the fashion and, 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 and apparel business, th there is so much that is emotional uh, in, in, the, in the products that we use and touch. Uh, it makes these things hard to industrialize, I guess. It, it, makes, it makes these outcomes uh, hard to 3D print, uh, uh, hard to mass produce uh, in, in any meaningful way. So, so that's the, the, the good news. Um, the, the challenge is is this thing that you've talked about a little bit earlier, which is which is the the art of of of, of uh, what we do. We should be very careful that that we least we forget, uh, and and that if we are not careful, it it certainly uh, these things don't come back once you once a generation has forgotten about it. Um, I, 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 very, I know very little about fashion. It's not been my area particularly, except in, in thinking your point about the processes of production. Um, the increase, the awareness, partly through technology and social media, and the fascination, more than a fascination, but a really ethical consideration about where does this come from. I mean, it's happening, with, obviously, with food, uh, ethical tourism, all sorts of areas, a kind of consciousness about, well, what is the ground I am on and how is that ground being worked and where does this come from? So those 
points about you know 125 hands passing something through. Yes, there is emotional intelligence and experience in a very particular way. But when things are made, exported, relabeled, branded, faked, um, the kind of consideration as to the authenticity of that experience seems to me to be very complex and very problematic. So where something resides, the emphasis on locally grown, you know, new kinds of food initiatives, like new clothing initiatives, it may not be fashion, but clothing initiatives, strikes me as one of the most important things that has happened in the inner city in the last decade, in my experience anyway, mm -hmm. to reveal those processes. So people begin to understand more about the complexities now of economic uh, impacts of globalization in ways that were not just streamlined and efficient. Well, we just have five more minutes, so um, I wanted to just quickly um um, make my last point, and then maybe if you have a, any last comments, and um, if, if we have time for a question, one maybe one question, and I know we'll have also some um, crosstalk at the end of all of these sessions. Um, that brings to light something we were talking a little bit earlier um, separately, and that is the notion um, of visibility and invisibility. Um, obviously, at the end of the line, you have the visibility of you know the item you buy or you know how it and then the invisibility of who made it, um, how it was made. Um, I was thinking also just about this notion of um, visibility and invisibility related to authorship and the authorship of you know, these usually you know, women working in factories that nobody sees, um, and how that sort of ends up on the label. Edward and I were talking about that earlier. You know, there's the, the hierarchy of the label that you're wearing maybe on the top, which is the designer label, which has a name, which has a certain kind of you know code to it, and then you have like the labels on the bottom, which is where it's made from, and usually it's not in a language you can understand, and it gives a little bit of a history of um, the 125 hands in the various places that this um, item that you've ended up with has traveled, but at the same time, you know every stitch. Um, everything sort of about that um, garment tells you something and was made by someone and has a kind of touch to it or residue. And so um, I guess I sort of um, wanted to get a sense of maybe your relationship to some of those um, thoughts and experiences, especially maybe now with women who are, as you said, going and making these things visible, making these experiences visible. Yeah. Yeah. In a different way. Yeah, yeah. Well, well certainly we, we are we are on the cusp of, of lots of opportunity for change, and and, and repurposing of, of, of what we do. I I I, I think uh, fundamentally one of one of the, the, the things that, that 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 bothers me, and one of the things that that I, I think we we collectively need to rethink is is this notion between ownership and stewardship. Uh, and which is something that, that, that you've touched on. We, you know, a generation ago, um, apparel are, are heirloom items that you, you repair and you have pass on, uh, and there's history and there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of attachment to, to that uh, beyond its functionality. And, and if we lose touch with that, um, we, 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 we take a, a lot of the romance and a lot of the... Uh, uh, the joy out of our lives uh, in, in the process, uh, and 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 so how we treat uh, how we treat the things that we we have uh, we are privileged to be able to handle is 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 important, um, and because but but that goes back to that if we value those things, then we would become interested in where did it come from, who who made this for me, why. And, and what is its, is its intended use, and, and what, how should I care, care for it? I, I, I think it's a, it's a difference in, in, in attitude, I think. So maybe fast fashion is a way to avoid all of those um, ideas of actually uh, resting, thinking, of yeah, those sorts yeah. of ethical qu uh, well, quandaries? Well, we don't have to be victims of these things. Uh, and, 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 and we should take responsibility for, for choosing to behave in that way. Uh, but certainly, there, there certainly are a lot of alternative ways of, 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 of uh, 
looking at that. No, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to particularly add to that. I think that's, uh, that's the key issue. As much as there's this kind of great advance into, you know, what it means to be human in the digital age, yeah. it's what is it to be human and ethical in the present condition? <laughs> there's a lot we haven't sorted out there. Well, and I think many people might, you know, be thinking about that. Well, just to be human. Well, there are certain ways of, you know, making the human back to the machine efficiency. Yeah. But there's still um, lots of ethical issues there. So, I mean, I'd be interested to know what other people really consider that. Do we have time for questions or no? Or do you want... Okay, so we'll, we'll save your questions for um, the uh, crosstalk. But um, I just wanted to say thank you to Edwin and to uh, Janice and just want to digging in a little bit because I think this is a, a really great opportunity to um, learn and to build more knowledge for uh, this uh, great enterprise that Milsix is uh, now initiating. So thank you so much.